Thank you for having me here today. I brought something for you that I'll give you later. Um, how are you feeling? Let's, let's, do, let's do a familiar thing right now. Um, let's center ourselves for a moment. We've probably been feeling a lot of things from this morning and from meeting each other. It's been really exciting. So close your eyes. Take a deep breath in and out. And just breathe for a moment and feel that breath moving in and out. Feel your feet on the ground. Feel your butt on the seat. And slowly put your hand into your pocket and pull out your phone. <laughs> and open your eyes. Do this with me. And open up your browser and go to this website. <laughs> and so you'll go to it, turn up the volume on your phone, flick that switch on the side if you need to. Do, 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 do. All right, loading mine up, turning up the volume. Oh, somebody's got it going. All right, I have it going now. So I want you to explore this sound, what's behind this website. This isn't something that you post a photo or status on, but hold it out straight in front of you. See the sound it makes. Maybe point it to the sky. Move it around a little bit. See what your neighbor is doing with it. Copy what they're doing. Do it better than how they did it. Now pretend like you're conducting an orchestra. Oh, all of us making this music together. Oh, now do your crazy gesture. Oh my God, and then lots of high fives. Ooh, all right. That's my talk. This is what I'm about. Making these sounds together. All right, and now we're gonna gently slow down. Oh my God, yay, look at, this. look at what we did together. Woo! Oh my God, thank you. Ah, my favorite thing is like immersive sound art, and so you just performed for me. Um, yeah, this is me. My full name is Coven the Virdi. You can call me Coven, K with an oven. Uh, Witchlight is me on the internet, like Twitter and Instagram and all those things. And here we are. So one question, after I started making a lot of different pieces, I started thinking a lot about how does it, I started thinking about art differently, the things I was making different. I was like, how does it see me? Does it perceive me at all? Does it respond to me at all? And I thought about who does the art see? Is it people who will intend to go to a gallery or who will walk by it? Or can I capture a wider audience that might be unexpected? And here I'll begin with this. Um, the first works that I really got excited about making were in the field of relational aesthetics. And this quote, I think, kind of captures that. The meaning we can make together is greater than what I can make alone. This was an artist in Portland, Gary Wiseman. And I thought about that, and I was like, how can I make expressive, collaborative works? Things like what we just did. So the first piece I'm going to start with is this piece, PDX I Love You. I used to live in Portland. And I thought a lot about Valentine's Day and how it was commercialized. And I wondered, like, what is it like, you know, if you were alone on Valentine's Day, that really sucks. So what if, what if, we, what if you were walking alone and then you saw a little heart that wasn't commercial? It was for you. And so I thought maybe I'll draw these hearts all around the city, but no, no, that, that's, not, that's not really going to scale up. How do I scale it up? All right, I'll go to a festival and make a little booth and then have a little piece of paper people can cut out and give out chalk and say, you can do this, draw this heart. Take a photo if you want to, send it back. People are like, oh, I could do that? And I'm like, yeah, you can do it. <laughs> um, and so I ended up, like this was before hashtag days, Instagram days, so I ended up getting these photos back uh, they were emailed to us and we put them on a, on a blog spot. Um, but these were the photos. And it wasn't until later that I looked back on these photos and realized people included themselves in it. Whoa. Okay, so once, once I'm like, yeah, you should do this, people jump on that, become really into that creative moment, but then also want to be a part of it. Like, look how proud he is about <laughs> this enormous heart he just put up. And he wanted to capture that moment. Like, I just did this with this stapler. 
um, and more hearts around the city. But it started making me think differently about the nature of making art and could it be something that I give or something that we can do together and what that feels like. Uh, here's another piece that was in Boston. And this took the metaphor of like a table that you can gather around in Legos. So this is a giant beach ball that we covered in fiberglass and magnets. And then we told people that we've discovered this planet with strange magnetic properties. And we need your help to build cities on it. And people started making little things. And it's all like with magnets. So the wonder of, of magnetism and playing with the different pieces and seeing what other people make and adding to it. Uh, my favorite part about this one, that's like a younger me over there. But this, ha I, I love seeing that there was a family on this, like a, a father, grandfather, and the granddaughter all playing with this together. And they're having like this new creative moment together. Otherwise, you know, here's a new way that they can relate to one another. So this, this piece begins with a familiar premise. It's like a microphone and, oh, I need some volume. Yeah, thank you. And the louder the sound, the brighter the LEDs glow. And you can imagine seeing this in a club, but here I thought about how this is a piece a sculpture, a piece of art that can hear you. So what if I put that outside in a Boston winter where it gets really cold? So we did that. We put it up by the Children's Museum, and I can imagine what happened at that time. And usually, if you yell like this in public, it's, it's generally inappropriate, but this piece is like, yeah, keep going, keep yelling, and then you get into it. You can speak, you can, you can yell in, in public. And it was by the Children's Museum, so of course it got into it too. Um, so here's, the, these are the, the light blades on the Boston Greenway. And they're these beautiful ambient light structures. And you can see people standing up there by the sidewalk to get a sense of scale. They have these nice colors, but we thought, all right, what if we made them interactive? So we got into the server. We added a color server or a way to text it so people could text colors, and then it would change the colors of these light blades. Cool. And add little Easter eggs, like random, and it would animate through something. Um, and then at the opening, a bunch of people texted it different colors, so it just kept on flashing different things. But what I thought was more fun was seeing the data. So the ones you'd expect... Red, blue, fish. Someone's texting it, fish. Um, you know, maybe they looked into the code and they saw fish. But then I looked into who's, who's texting fish. Somebody texted it fish 40 times. So I'm like, I'm just imagining if I had somebody like commuting to work and they're, being, they're like, hey, you know, to their buddies, like, oh, I can text this fish and it'll change. And their friends are like, no, you can't. And then they do it and it's magic. Um, but rarely do you have like agency over things of that scale in a city. And so to be able to change that, what, how does that change your sense of place in the city? So as I thought back to some of these interactive works, initially the interaction was a place to get more meaning from the art, but I realized like it does more. It changes how you relate to the space, how you relate to each other, how you feel expressive in the works. You can make a space more welcoming, a public space more welcoming. You can invite exploration. Someone goes into that, into that, I don't know, magnetized thing and they start playing with different shapes and they start exploring it, seeing what's possible. And then it also cultivates this curiosity. What is this thing? What is this magic that's happening? So the metaphor I like to use is, you know, here we are in this theater, and I really wanted you to yell in the beginning and make sounds, and we did that. But generally, you don't, you don't do that, really. And you don't really run in and out. I like to think about it as this. So instead of everybody looking in one direction, it's like, all right, we can all meet up and make up games together. The boundaries are permeable. We can come in and out. So what would it be to make more artwork like this and make more media like this? Um, after making some interactive physical pieces, I thought, all right, what would this be like on the internet? So this was inspired by one of Kusama's pieces where you put dots all around a room. You have little stickers. Um, I thought, what would that be like online? So you add a dot to a website, and then it shows up on other people, for other people who are on that website. They're connected. And I... I tweeted this out, and it was cool to see what ended up happening. Like, people would just start signaling each other. The moment you're on it and you see the little circles growing, you're like, I'm not alone here. There's other people here. And then you want to signal to them. If there's any question about it, it itself becoming a medium of communication. Somebody wrote that. 
Maybe they were stuck in the circle land. It's probably not the best place to ask for help, but it's the medium. And once it's on a screen, then you can play with it in different formats. So we thought again, I thought again about scale in the city and what do you have control over in a city? So we projected it at the scale of a building. And so you could go there to this location. This was in Grand Rapids. You could go there. And, and they had iPads and phones, and you could add circles. Or you could do this from home. And I did it from Somerville in, in, in Massachusetts. And I could collaborate with people there. All of a sudden, that public space opened up a little bit more using this interaction. Here's a few more installations of it. Cool. And I, I shared this at a conference, and I, I did a live demo with it. And somebody during the conference just like injected, script injected it, they hacked it and added these patterns. And I was like, this is cool, like awesome, make it your own. Uh, and then I got this video of a, of a way to play with it that I never even imagined. That's fun. And so this is a, a father who's, who sent it to me of his children playing with it. And I, almost, I, I felt like I was gonna cry seeing this moment that they had together. It just felt really meaningful and, and, and Beautiful. Here's another dot exploration. In this one, instead of adding circles and sharing it, it's that you are that circle and you move around and make sounds. If I'm on the site, then I hear and see you as well. So you can imagine what happens. It's kind of chaotic. But something happens in it. It happens right at the end here. Right there. Right there. Those two dots start to notice each other and start mirroring each other. And they're so, sort of like, it's very anonymous when you're in that. I don't know who they are, but when you start realizing that they see you and you see them and you start interacting with one another in that space, it becomes really, it feels really intimate in a way. And I remember I was in it for like half an hour just going around making sounds with someone, and then I had to leave and there was no way for me to say goodbye, and I felt really emotional about that. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, sometime later I was looking at, all right, how are people talking about this thing? And, oh, here's another one. This, this one's more ominous, but it's like three people syncing up. And so someone posted this. They were like, I just harmonized with somebody, but I don't know who. Is that weird? And then someone else responded, it's natural and beautiful. And I was like, you get me. Oh, my God. We're, we're all having this moment. Things are going to be okay. This is what we played with just now, a little bit earlier. And this was just like a little test. What happens if you take the accelerometer on a phone and hook it up to a synthesizer in the browser? And it was a prototype, but people got so into it that I was like, all right, let's just run with it. Let me make that its own thing. But it was in a pre precursor to this, which was instead of phones and, and sharing the screen, this was like projecting up on a wall. And what you do on the phone is map to some visual. Here I was thinking about what could be a public art piece that we all contribute to the same canvas. And this was at, here's another video of a few people. Everybody gets a different color. And so it kind of takes the energy of the crowd in front and reflects it in some way. But what I liked about this, I just made that as a website. So when people came out, they're like, oh, I, I love that. I was like, you can have it. Here are the links. It works on your computer too. And that's nice to be able to do. Whereas with some of the sculptures before, I couldn't have done that. So here, there's some motivation for me of what is this new technology available? What are ways that I can make, not an application, but I can make something more expressive out of it to make things. So here are some other pieces. Uh, instead of everybody contributing to a canvas, what if there was like a central person who broadcasted sounds out? So here, there's this composer who's sending sounds out to everyone's phone. And a performance becomes, goes from something which is like, I'm performing on stage for you, to the sound is coming from all of us. And we can all have some agency in changing it. And as you can see, people are more talkative. They, it becomes more of a social experience rather than a quiet watching experience. Here is a piece that, where the direction of your phone plays a sound. And if you, if you go in the right direction, it plays a more harmonious sound. So it ends up guiding people through a crowded room. And I, I made this for an art opening and thought it would be fun to get people to just like bump into each other. And once you bump into someone, they can't even be mad because you didn't do it. It was the app that guided you into them. And so this is kind of like the sound it makes. It's very dissonant until you're going the right way. And then you step in the right direction. All right, peeps. Um, 
Oh, here's a, uh, another web piece that uses your face. And I thought, all right, what, what happens if I use a face and put a bunch of effects to it? And people just have, the moment they see their face in the work, like, I could, you see people sticking their tongues out, like right, right there. It's gonna happen again, right there. Uh, people just get really vain, and, and I, I kind of love that. I love seeing, like, once, once you represent someone, that they feel comfortable getting a little bit more bizarre. Um, here's a piece combining, like, touch and visual. So here, using the conductivity of water, when you touch these two fountains, it triggers this, or it triggers that visualization that played. Um, here's another face piece where uh, I'm, I'm kind of sharing a bunch of my experiments with you so you can see, get an idea of, the, of, of what's going on here. But, all right, so this is uh, older me and, and, or, or younger me, and I just thought it would be cool to pixel sort it. And I could do that to my own face, that's fun. But I, I put it online, and then someone blogged about it, and then people just started sending me their GIFs of their faces being pixel sorted. And now, like, going from a website, it just being numbers, it's like faces and people who are interacting with it. And I loved it. I loved bringing people more into the work, even though it was digital. Here's someone with their cat. They wanted to merge with the cat. And so following from this face, what if, what if I took that and brought it back into a public, concept, uh, uh, public space? What would that be like? And so we made this giant face, and, and init in initial tests, we had this little one, and we're like, what do we do with this? Boo, boo, za, za, wow. That is the stuff of nightmares. Uh, and so we made it bigger, and then we invited people to project their own face into it. And of course, people got, started getting really bizarre. And we brought it to this festival and made a little like area where you could sit and position yourself in the camera. And it almost became like a little photo booth. People would sit down and have their photo taken with their family as this giant face. And what I noticed is like, when you sit there and the art recognizes you, it broadcasts you to everyone in the festival. And all of a sudden, you become like that benevolent god or angry demon. You are enormous. And so people would respond with happiness or like freaky faces. But even more so, what excited me was, how does this change the way in which we think about identity in public space? Who is represented in our, in, our, in our statues and monuments? And are we, like, all of us, we could go to it and we could have our, our, our time with it and, and take a photo or take a video and be projected enormous right alongside that building. All right, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. These are more like little web experiments I did, but I want to see, now you're getting like a sneak peek of all this other stuff. I want to go into something more introspective. And that is like, so after making a bunch of these interactive works and encouraging people to do them, do these different pieces, it was exciting, it was fun to explore, but there's like a moment that hit where, these are like playing with different pieces, where I had a bunch of enthusiasm and motivation and excitement to make it. I'm exploring this new technology, I'm exploring this new potential. But then at a certain point, that motivation dwindles. It's like, is this really what I'm interested in anymore? And this happens often, it's nothing new. But I thought a lot about making things outwardly, and I was thinking like, I feel like I wanna spend more time just with me. I don't wanna be out so much. And I was thinking about what that meant. And I thought of it a lot as decreasing entropy, just doing less, being okay being at home, being okay. I thought about this metaphor of grooming, like just taking care of oneself in no productive capacity. Like, I, it, nothing, it can't be commodified. Nobody wants to pay for that, but it's spending time with myself. And I saw this video, and you might know this artist. She's a huge inspiration for me. And I just watched her draw, and I was like, this feels like the most relaxing thing ever. And this is Kusama. And she does these intricate pattern drawings. And it was more the gesture and the focus. So, I just, I took this previous work that I did in generative art and geometries and I thought, what if I drew that? So I drew it and then I just posted it online and it got more likes than my selfies. <laughs> and I realized I can't use selfies anymore. But I got obsessed with, with doing these lines and they were long enough to draw that like, I couldn't actually think of it in a practical way. It's like, they're just gonna take so long to do. Um, so I have to get really excited about the moment in it. So this kind of changed the way I thought about 
creating. It, it helped me get more to like a relaxing cycle and be more introspective. So I started doing it more and, and, and get different remixes. I went, I went back home for Christmas and my, and my mom was like, hey, I used to do this as a school kid. And I was like, oh, cool, what did you do? What was your algorithm? And then she described it to me. And then I drew her pattern and, and sh she was like, yours is better than mine. And I'm like, you're such a mom, thank you. <laughs> Um, but I scaled it up and, and, and started doing like time lapses and just like kind of in this I felt a flow. I felt something good. I just kept going with it. And my favorite is like seeing people's comments on it. Like I'm doing this and this is like, you know, obviously a process and someone's like, go faster. I'm like, that's not the point. Wait for the time lapse. So my favorite part about it though was not so much drawing. Drawing it was more for me, but when I'd see other people start sending me back things. They were like, oh, I was thinking about this and I, and I just drew this. Or like someone's doing a to-do list and covered their whiteboard in a pattern and then stepped in the center of it. And I'm like, oh my God, I could never do that. <laughs> um, I got a note from the city of Boston and they were like, we want something really colorful here. And I was like, all right, speaking my language. So I did a pattern there last summer. That was a finished piece. And then this past winter, walked into this room and this is at Facebook Boston, and they, they brought me in as an artist in residence. And mm -hmm. I just kind of got obsessed again with this process. In this case, it involved more of my body, like my whole body moving up and down and being very intentional about that. And because I was going up and down so much, I had to think a lot about like, how am I bending, how am I moving? I don't want to like, strain any part of myself. And then it, for this room, I kind of got to know it in a really, like I, I knew every inch of that room because I was just, my hand would go over it, and I would consider, should I make a mark there? And then the finished piece, or people playing with it, and then the finished piece. And, and it almost, for me, it almost embeds like that meditative moment that I had in, in making it, but also like that, that obsession and that be okay with the process of it. Because while making, if I thought of the end, it would be, I would be miserable, so then I'd have to quickly change the way I was thinking about the work. I had another moment of this. You can see, I mean, this happens a lot in our creative selves. And I was thinking like, okay, all of this work is abstract. What is it saying? And of course it would say stuff about public space, how we interface with public space, how we interface with each other. But how do I pull myself up when, I, when I'm there, when I'm questioning all of this stuff? And I thought a lot about like, all right, how am I feeling? This nine hole, there's all this other stuff. How do I get to this spot? Maybe that's a way, maybe that's a way out of it. But I realized a lot of it is like seeing, seeing, you know, like, like reflecting on the works or even coming here and taking lots of notes. Like I took lots of notes this morning. And I'm like, okay, okay, these are going to be the stars that I eat later on because they're inspiring me. Um, but I thought more about how do I get more concrete and specific in my messages and more clear? I don't want to deal with abstraction anymore. So I started writing and it was really awkward and started drawing and it was really unusual. I'm used to doing geometric interactive stuff and, and it's coming out really weird and but I'm like maybe I can connect with people on it or I can say clearer messages like maybe I can use this and develop my voice or make something that is comforting. Okay this I'll, I'll, I won't show that one. That one I would need the browser for it. So I want to end with with this that Right now, I started thinking a lot about the nature of voice and, and, and encouraging other people's voices in the creativity and the, and the works that they would make. Um, but I feel like in this new media art, like in this space of new media art, a lot of it is about exploring a new technology or it's about creating spectacle. And I really feel like there's something from art direction or illustration that can, or poetry that can bring something very powerful to this previous work. And right now, I think of us as, like we as designers, what we're making, something that I made for myself a few months ago when I was feeling overwhelmed. There's a lot of overwhelming things right now. More for like personal, personal things, ways I wanted to grow, but even bigger problems. And this is my last slide. I want to give it to you. And I'm not going to project it because I want you to have it and I want you to see it in your hands. And here you go. Yeah. And we could just hand out. And Grab one and, and, and pass it along. Oh, yeah, sure. Cool. And I'll just grab one of them. Sure. 
Yeah, and if you don't have one for any reason, uh, I can get you one afterwards. But um, what it says is, um, I, I put this up in my room so I could look at it every day. And it says, every day I will make progress, even small, in the well-being of myself and the world. And I want to emphasize the even small, because with some of these big problems, some of these big things that are happening, even if it's in your personal life, it's so easy to put it off. And I, I, I put it off, I mean, you know, as any, anyone would. And then I just realized that, all right, if I can do something small towards it, it's going to get worse. It's going to get harder. The problem will get bigger, but eventually I can overcome it. Um, yeah, so... Thank you. Yeah, I love your earrings. Oh, thank you. I think we're at significant risk of everybody just going out in the street and grabbing some chalk and doing what we do. Um, thank you for that. That was much needed. Um, how many, you know, very quantitative, how many hours a week do you play? Do I play? Yes. All right. So I got to tell you, you're going to see me around this event with a backpack and be like, why, is, why do you have a backpack everywhere you go? And I have it because I, have, I put like markers and, and paper in it. And recently I've been getting into drawing. So if we're hanging out, we're, we might draw together. Um, I don't know. It's like, a, it's like a try to integrate it into the everyday moments or the conversation. Because yeah. I, I noticed this, like, when, when I, when I, uh, there, there, there are times when you try to bring something creative into a workplace situation and people think you're screwing around. The, the, the now widespread trend of adding foosball table or whiteboard with colorful markers to a workplace, pro play or anti play? It sounds like fun. I like bright colors, so if that's happening there. But I think, like, I, I get excited about how can you change your outlook so that it starts coming into just general conversations, too. And it can be really difficult to get to that place. And so, like, we did, I, like, we did it immediately. And that wasn't, that didn't just come naturally. That was, like, after giving talks for a while and realizing, all right, the moment we all laugh together is the moment we connect. So how do I make that happen faster? And... And so pieces like this, like I got into making interactive art because I loved seeing people meet each other through it. And so like, what little, what little things can you make that can, that can create that moment or make that moment happen faster? Uh, some people are really like, I mean, you know, you meet them and then you, you're laughing and you're like, oh, this is the best. And then you feel like you're really connecting. So we've been talking today about interactive play, but I know you've also been really interested in interactive storytelling. And I read something that you wrote um, earlier this year about the role that storytelling can play in trying to heal democracy. And I've always had this, uh, you know, trying to combat the jaded feeling that many Americans have about politics and political process right now, and just getting more centered in who they are and where they are. I've always had this feeling that politics is a little bit like having a neighbor that you don't get along with. You know, that, that, that guy who's always tossing the grass clippings over the fence or something. And that people, um, people's discomfort with politics has to do with the friction of those interactions. Interactivity can certainly give us a feeling of warmth and connection with other people who we understand. But do you think that interactivity has a role to play in getting us more comfortable with that friction? Wow. Um, <laughs> I, so to speak to the first part about storytelling, that actually came to mind originally because from one of my neighbors, and, and this is when I was living in Boston, and at the place I was living, across the street, there were some new uh, buildings that had been developed. And she told me initially they were going to be much higher, uh, but the neighborhood gathered, and then they protested it. And they got the signatures they needed, they had the meetings they needed, and in the end, the building was much smaller than it was intended to be. And I thought, wow, 
sometimes when you hear about these stories, it never, I mean, like, it feels almost like it never ends well. Why don't we hear this story more often? Or why don't we share this story so we don't feel so jaded when, when we're acting? Or we, we feel like it's actually going to something. Stories um, about process actually working. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then in terms of interactivity, um, bringing people together from different viewpoints, um, I think there's a powerful way for people to see each other's experiences in a way that can be really, really deep. And there's certain projects that come to mind for this specifically. Um, like there's this one where they put up screens in different parts of the world and you would walk into this like storage container and then see somebody else from way, like way afar. The other side of the planet. Yeah, the other side of the planet. And then it's just you and them alone and, and you may not speak the same language, but it's like you can have a, a moment together. And I, I just thought about, I saw the, the artist of, of that piece speak and just thought about how powerful that kind of connection can be about really recognizing and seeing somebody else. And I think like this, these interactive works have the potential to really create an architecture around particular ways to interact that can be very, very uh, fulfilling or, or foster connections that otherwise would be difficult. The actual ma making of empathy. What are, could you tell us about other, um, other storytelling or play projects you've seen that you thought were particularly, were really good at reaching people wherever they are? Yeah. There was like, um, I remember seeing this poetry project, which they just pull it, put up like flyers everywhere about like Texas number and get a poem. And I just really liked how, I liked how that brought poetry to everyday moments. And it also included a little bit of surprise in it, like, oh, what am I gonna get? You know, it's like a little fortune cookie, like you don't know what you're gonna get. <laughs> and, but, and also, it, it used a technology that is much more available, like texting. It didn't use an app, uh, it used texting. I like that. And then you could submit poetry as well. Thank you so much for this. I feel like I need to just go clear about a third of my calendar for next week and just write and play. Thank you. Helen D. Beardy.